Hello and welcome to today's webinar on nursing home discharge and transfer procedures. I'd like to begin by providing a basic definition for the terms discharge and transfer. According to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid State Operations Manual Interpretive Guide, discharge refers to moving the resident to a non-institutional setting when the releasing facility ceases to be responsible for the resident's care. The term transfer refers to moving the resident from the facility to another legally responsible institutional setting. In this presentation, I'll use the term discharge to loosely refer to both transfer and discharge. Let's begin by talking about the legal basis for discharge. There are only seven situations in which discharge is proper. The first situation is when a resident's needs cannot be met at the nursing home which basically means that a transfer or discharge is necessary for the resident's welfare. An example of this scenario would be that there is a resident with progressing dementia who has repeatedly left a nursing home property that is not secured. A resident's doctor, in consultation with the resident's support system, comes to the decision that it is in the best interest of the resident to transfer to a facility that is more secure. Now notice that I mentioned the resident's physician. The decision that the facility cannot meet a resident's needs must be made by the resident's physician, not just any physician, the resident's physician. The second situation in which discharge is appropriate is when a resident no longer needs the services of the nursing home. A good example is when a resident falls and injures his hip. He then has hip surgery and goes to a nursing home to recover. When he has completed therapy and is doing better, it is appropriate to discharge the resident. Again, that determination should be made and documented, documented by the resident's physician. A third situation in which discharge is appropriate is when a resident poses a danger to the safety of others. An example of this would be if a resident intentionally injures another resident. A nursing home facility is there to care for the resident, and so discharge should not be the first choice. The facility should assess the resident, give appropriate mental or psychological treatment, consider a care plan meeting to discuss any care issues and resolve concerns, and ensure the resident understands the possible consequences of their choice. The fourth situation where discharge is appropriate is when a resident poses a danger to the health of others in the facility. An example of this would be where a resident chooses not to seek treatment for a contagious illness that puts others at risk. We have to remember that the resident has the right to refuse treatment. Exercise of that right has consequences sometimes, and those consequences may include discharge. Another legal requirement in this situation is that a doctor must document the risk. The fifth situation in which the resident's discharge is appropriate is when the resident has failed to pay for a stay at the facility. Note that if a resident becomes eligible for Medicaid after admission, the facility can't charge more than what's allowable under Medicaid. A facility can't just say, you failed to pay. They have to provide a bill or similar notice about charges owed. The sixth situation is when a resident, responsible party, family member, or legal representative requests a voluntary discharge. A good example is the Money Follows the Person program, which provides assistance for Medicaid-eligible individuals who currently reside in a nursing home and wish to transfer back into the community. There, they will receive support services in their home or their apartment. The final situations in which discharge would be appropriate are when either the facility withdraws from the program that pays for the patient's care, like Medicare or Medicaid, or when the facility ceases to operate. In the latter circumstance, the facility must provide 60 days notice that the facility is going to close. Now that we have an understanding of the seven situations in which discharge is legally appropriate, let's look at some common but improper reasons for transfer or discharge. Sometimes the facility will require the resident to sign a behavioral contract. Later, the facility will claim that the resident has violated the behavioral contract and will cite that as a reason for discharge. The truth, however, is that a resident retains her right to stay in the facility, even if she has agreed to special conditions for her stay. 
There are only seven valid reasons for discharge or transfer, as we discussed before, and a resident cannot voluntarily contract into more. As an ombudsman, you can be an advocate for residents and help them to avoid signing these kinds of contracts in the first place. A second common example of improper discharge is when the facility says to a resident, you must leave the nursing home because you are refusing medical treatment. A resident has the right to refuse medical treatment. Remember the resident who could be transferred or discharged if they posed a threat to the health of others? That's an extreme circumstance, and in most cases, residents refusing medical treatment cannot be legally discharged. A third situation in which discharge is improper but common is where a facility might say, the resident is being discharged because they have problematic behaviors. Involuntary discharge should not be a facility's first response to a resident's challenging behavior. A facility is there to care for the resident and they should work with the resident's doctor to respond to resident actions by assessing them, treating them, working through behavior modification programs, and by providing medication and counseling. Unfortunately, it is not uncommon for a nursing home to mislabel the reason for discharge. One common mislabel is cannot meet needs. A facility might cite this reason for discharge while going ahead and treating others with comparable diagnoses. What should an ombudsman do when they suspect a situation is mislabeled cannot meet needs? Some things to consider would be whether the resident's actions were discussed in a care plan meeting, if a new care plan not, might be needed, how the facility cares for other residents with similar needs, and what strategies can be learned from those situations. Another example of a situation in which transfer or discharge is improper is when a facility claims that a resident's care is just too expensive. In truth, the cost of a resident's care is no reason for discharge. Another common but improper reason is where a facility might say that resident is a complainer and needs to be discharged. Residents have the right to complain, they have the right to freedom of choice, they have a right to express their concerns to facility members, and exercising these rights is no reason for discharge. Some other invalid reasons for discharge that ombudsmen have encountered include unsafe use of a motorized wheelchair, being argumentative, and frequently leaving the facility premises. None of these reasons fall within the seven valid reasons for discharge or transfer, and therefore none of them are appropriate. Now let's turn to notice requirements. Under the law, a facility must provide a resident, and if known, a responsible party, family member, or legal representative with a written notice that they will be discharged from the facility. In most circumstances, the law requires that the written notice come at least 30 days before the discharge is to take place. Although 30 days is the typical timetable for discharge, there are some exceptions to this rule. The first exception is where the safety of others in the facility would be endangered and therefore a more immediate transfer is necessary. The second exception is where the health of others would be in danger and a more rapid transfer must take place. The third situation is where a resident is healthy enough for a more immediate transfer and it doesn't make sense for the resident to stay the full 30 days. The final exception is where a more immediate transfer is necessary for the health of the resident. Now that we've established the timetable for this requirement, let's talk about what should be included in the written notice. This is a sample discharge letter. The first required component of the notice letter is the reason for the discharge. It should be one of the seven discharge reasons we discussed earlier, so for example, the facility cannot meet the resident's needs. The next required component is the date on which the transfer will take place. It should come 30 days after receipt of the notice, unless it's one of the exceptions we just talked about. Another required component is the specific location to which the resident is being discharged. The specific location must be determined in consult with the resident and his or her representatives. You've probably noticed that I've emphasized the word specific twice. That's because sometimes facilities will put in unacceptable vague locations 
like the location of your choice, or they'll put down a previous home address, but there's no willing caregiver available or there are inadequate home health services. They might put down a homeless shelter, and these are unacceptable locations. The fourth required component is a statement that the resident has a right to appeal a discharge. The fifth and final required component of the discharge notice is the name, address, and telephone number of the ombudsman who serves the resident. In addition, in the case of a resident with an intellectual or developmental disability, there should be contact information for the state mental health authority or the mental retardation authority. Now let's talk about discharge planning. Under the law, a nursing facility is required to help a resident prepare for discharge. This means that nursing home staff, in coordination with the resident, should undertake a series of steps to make sure the transition goes smoothly. As an ombudsman, you may consider working with residents and staff to ensure that discharge planning is well executed. Here I'm going to discuss some important topics that may be, that may be covered in the discharge planning process. I do so to get you thinking about how you might be able to act as an advocate for someone involved in the discharge planning process. There are four very key topics involved in discharge planning. One important topic to discuss at a care plan meeting is future care. Facility staff should help the resident plan where they will get care after they are discharged. Issues that could, should, could be considered in this discussion are whether or not home health care is an option and how the resident will get to and from the medical provider's office. As an ombudsman, you may wish to advocate for a resident by making sure that they have a plan for where they will get care in the future. You might also consider referring them to community resources that could help them in their new home. The second issue that should be discussed in a successful care plan meeting is the resident's health. The facility staff might consider developing a written summary of important information about their resident's health conditions. This summary might include information about what the resident could do to improve his or her health conditions, what problems or side effects the resident might look out for, and who the resident should contact if complications arise. As an ombudsman, you could advocate for residents by reminding them that it's okay to request this kind of preparation before they're discharged. Another important issue that should be discussed in the care plan meeting is the resident's medication. Facility staff should help the resident prepare a list of medications and include information about the time of day to take the medicine, the number of pills that should be taken, and other such information. Other issues that should be discussed are whether or not the resident can take medicines that he or she may have at home, who their resident can call if there are questions about the medication, and where the resident can get refills for the medication, and how they will get to and from the dispensary. As an ombudsman, you might help advocate for a resident by reminding them that it's okay to ask questions about their lists of medications during the care plan meeting, or by checking to see whether or not the resident felt comfortable with the medication plan developed during the care plan meeting. Discharge planning should also focus on recovery and support. One thing that facility staff should go over are the activities that a resident is prepared to do upon leaving the facility. Are they able to climb stairs? Are they able to drive? Are, are they able to bathe? And are they able to cook? Other important issues that may need to be discussed are whether or not there is any medical equipment that might help the resident, and who will arrange for the resident to get that equipment. Also, who will serve as the resident's caregiver? Does that caregiver need any special skills, such as learning how to change a bandage or helping a resident with transfer in and out of a wheelchair? As an, as an ombudsman, you might help a resident prepare to discuss these issues with facility staff and their family members and legal representatives. By making sure that the facility staff helps the resident and his family members and representatives consider these important questions, you can help ensure that the resident has a successful transition into their new home. I hope the information provided here will help you be an advocate for residents involved, or involved in discharge or transfer from a nursing home. Thank you very much for your time.